Welcome to Compound Thesis, where we discuss the intersection of crypto and the capital markets. I'm Jim Hiltner, and I'm the head of sales at Compound. I'm super excited to be joined today by Guillaume Ponchin. He's the head of crypto at Stripe. Guillaume, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, super exciting announcement. We'll get into that in a minute, but we'd just love to go into the origin story of you know how Stripe got into crypto. It seems like you know back in fall of last year is when the team was spun up. We'd love to you know hear a little bit more about the team and what your role is there. Absolutely. So, I we've worked on crypto multiple times, uh, continuously, sort of since 2014, very early. Um, and so I've led the team since the beginning of 2021, essentially the, the reboot, the latest incarnation of the, the crypto team at Stripe. Um, and give you the, the origin story a little bit. This was motivated by, by user demand. We first fiat exchanges, um, fiat to crypto exchanges, NFT marketplaces, a number of users that were asking us, well, can you just process fiat payments for us? Um, and then we... We started doing that. Essentially, it's, it's all about risk and, and uh, uh, management of uh, licenses and regulations. Um, and we started seeing a lot more demand. And the more we were talking to users, the more we realized, hey, there is a lot of companies here, those that rely on Stripe, lot, those that are very much startup size. And, and the overwhelming feedback we got was, it's difficult. Like Everything about being a developer in this space is difficult. Uh, the building blocks. Some of them are very well done. I think node infrastructure has come a long way and it's pretty easy to use. Um, but others like on-ramping and, and payments do not really have good solutions yet. Um, and so the whole spectrum, like from YC startups all the way to a Shopify, a Twitter, or like very big platforms that uh, Stripe uh, powers, um, we got this sort of overwhelming feedback. Um, and so this to us sounded very much like the early days of, of payments. Right? If you remember in the 2000 era, it was incredibly difficult to accept payments online. And then Stripe came along and it became uh, seven lines of code. And many other companies sort of, uh, also made it a lot simpler, but that very much vibed with that early DNA of, of Stripe. Can we make it a lot easier? And can we then enable all these startups and developers to, uh, to build whatever they want to build? Um, and so we wanted to do the same for the basic operations in Web3. Like onboarding a user is difficult. Um, building, uh, uh, creating wallet for a user is difficult. Accepting payment is difficult. Like none of this should take 20 minutes and a PhD in uh, cryptography and uh, uh, many, many steps. Like all of this should be incredibly easy. Uh, so that, that's sort of how it came about 2021. Um, we decided to reboot the crypto team and uh, now here we are. So when you talk about the, uh, you know, hearing from users, was that coming from merchants, developers, consumers? Like, where were you hearing the loudest voices asking to create these types of experiences within their apps? Yeah, I think it, it always starts from the users that are today on Stripe, like the, from the mom and pop merchants, yoga studio, all the way to the big e-commerce platforms or, or uh, marketplaces, uh, freelancer economy, the creator economy. Um, they actually came fairly uniformly from, from all angles. Um, it's just, hey, crypto is hot. We want to do something. We don't know how to. Please help us. So it's sort of the message. And then what, like, as you hear that feedback from the market, um, you know, what's the general approach that you take to, you know, building tools or different, you know, developer services in the crypto space? Can you kind of walk through what that process looks like? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the, I think the, the biggest question for us was, okay, we're Stripe. We have a particular DNA and, and experience. Um, what can we contribute? What is the role that Stripe should play in this ecosystem? We can't do everything. Um, but obviously, the fiat to crypto interface is a good place to start. Like, we are good at fiat payments. We can do like all the basic payments, but also all the reconciliation, accounting, like, all of these ancillary things you need to do um, around that. And then we can lean on partners. We can, uh, some people have learned how to do the crypto bits really, really well, lean on them. And then we put it together. Like we make it very easy to integrate a fiat to crypto solution or a crypto to fiat solution in, in a few lines of code. Yeah, so uh, on the back of that, then that was you know, a big announcement coming out of Stripe last week was the mm -hmm. you know, ability to embed a fiat to crypto on ramp. Um, just allowing developers to basically easily onboard their their customers. There's a lot of KYC and fraud 
you know, toolkits embedded in that, in that link service. Um, just curious, you know, how does this differentiate from other products that are in the market? And, and if you could kind of talk a little bit about what this new solution is, is unlocking for developers would be really, you know, interesting to see how this platform is going to unlock you new use cases. Yeah, so the, the on ramp we launched about two weeks ago, finally I can talk about it. Um, <laughs> we've gotten very positive feedback and um, I, anecdotally, this was our most read blog post for the year. Uh, the second most read blog post is the previous announcement we did in the space of crypto. I guess crypto uh, a community likes to read blog. Um, <laughs> and so the, so very positive feedback despite all the turbulences that are happening at the moment, it's sort of, it is an important component. We believe in the long-term value of crypto. We want to contribute this type of components. Um, and so more to your question, maybe, um, this idea of on-ramping is not new. Like, very many companies are very, very good at this, uh, are doing this and have been doing this for a few years. Um, we think we can, we have a unique value proposition here. Um, by making it sort of easy to customize and embed right in the middle of the application instead of uh, a redirect. You, you have a dApp, you have a wallet, you can do the on-ramping right in the context with your branding, with your sort of, um, uh, without interrupting the, the flow of a user going through the, the payments process. Um, and so that was sort of one piece of the puzzle. And the other piece of the puzzle is there is a certain bar of quality that Stripe aspires to and, and have People have come to expect from us, especially developers. Like corner cases are handled; you don't have to worry about this. Uh, the documentation is well done; you don't have to worry about this. Like all of this so quality bar that we want to also bring to the table, um, and hopefully uh, help developers. Uh, and so, this on ramp flow is essentially putting together all of these components that we've built already, and then a few pieces that are new because of the crypto space. Um, it's identity verification, it's fraud controls, it's uh, the link sort of uh, remember me mechanism where um, the second time you come, we know you, you don't have to uh, to re-onboard. You can just click once and then you're done. Um, and so all of these components, we put them together. We target the web free developer, uh, but this is very much a universal component. It should be usable by a web free developer. It should be usable at the scale of a, a Shopify, Twitter, or a big platform. Um, we expect over time other companies will take that and sort of bundle it into a more end-to-end -end solution. Like, hey, mint an NFT from beginning to end. The on-ramp is somewhere in the middle, but um, we offer so, like, that platform company would offer the end-to-end -end solution for minting an NFT or for uh, a peer-to-peer -peer payment. So uh, we don't necessarily need to be in the business of providing the end-to-end -end solutions, but we want to provide the best building block we can uh, for on-ramping. So can you talk a little bit about how that's different than what the like user journey would look like today? I would imagine that, you know, the way that you're describing it is, you know, directly within the NFT marketplace or um, within the, you know, the, the dApps that are your partners that you're launching with. It is just a very simple put your debit card or credit card information in here as a consumer and be able to convert very easily, you know, directly into Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever the the. The particular asset might be. Can you just like juxtapose that with what the you know previous user journey would look like in other experiences, and just you know just to like really hammer home how unique and different this is? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, so the the flow you want and the flow I think the on ramp achieves is if you take, <clears throat> for instance, Audius, which is a mm -hmm. Spotify like service where you can uh, listen to music, tip tip the artists that you like, uh, and so the the flow you would want for tipping an artist is you click on, I like this artist, put in the credit card, tip, done. Like it should be as simple as that. Um, the flow that if without the on-ramp you end up having to do is you click on tip the artist, um, you realize, oh, I need a wallet. Okay, let me go create a wallet. Um, <laughs> then, oh, I need to top up my wallet. Let me go to a different service to top up my wallet and then come back. And maybe I remember to to come back and then then I can finish paying with the, um, the Ethereum or, or whatever currency uh, Audius uh, uses. Um, and so the, it's essentially doing it all in line as, as in line as possible, as opposed to jumping from service to service. 
Yeah, I mean, that disjointed experience is kind of the complaint that a lot of people have about crypto mm -hmm. so that, you know, there's exchanges here, there's wallets here, there's applications there, they're all on different chains. And so being able to manage your assets, which, you know, the beauty of crypto is that you're in custody of your assets, if you so choose, uh, mm -hmm. with the infrastructure that is available to you, but also at the same time, it's super complicated. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned there, there's potentially a delay in, you know, settlement of, you know, fiat to crypto at an exchange, and then, you know, getting that plugged into an application, uh, you might forget, you know, when to, when to, when your crypto is actually settled in your, in your account, then move it to your wallet and then get to the application to actually perform the action versus instantaneously being able to do that. Um, super beneficial from a, a user experience perspective, which, you know, I think crypto desperately needs. Yeah. Curious though, on the, on the merchant side, because, you know, fraud disputes, chargebacks yeah. are, you know, often major pain points for call it e-commerce. If you're a Shopify or you're a Walmart, um, and Stripe does a great job of, of, you know, building the tools to, you know, help prevent fraud, but also to help facilitate kind of chargebacks and dispute mechanisms. Yep. Is that similar in, in, in crypto and Web3 or, or how is that different if it's not similar? We actually go one step further. <clears throat> um, the, so the merchants care about conversion rate and they care about so, uh, minimizing fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the conversion rate, the uh, inline story makes it much, much better. On the minimizing fraud, essentially what we're doing here is that Stripe is the merchant of record. Uh, it, we take it upon us. Uh, so it's a little bit more pricey, obviously, than um, if we don't do that. Um, but handling fraud and so the complications of balancing fraud with authorization rate, with conversion rate, um, at the moment is incredibly difficult to do well in crypto. And so we want to see the traffic. We want to be on the hook for that. So we optimize it, and so it gets really, really good. Uh, if a merchant gets to the scale where they want to optimize their cost uh, and they want to take on the fraud, they believe they have the, the manpower to do this, um, I think we will be happy to split. But um, the, at the moment, just to make it incredibly e easy for, for adoption, we, it's our problem. Like fraud is our problem, um, chargebacks and, and, and such. OK, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. So, you know, as this is this is one new because uh, you mentioned earlier uh, this year, you announced, uh, I think it was Stripe payouts mm -hmm. uh, for crypto, um, Twitter being one of the launch partners. So in order to be able to pay, um, you know, for tipping or for subscription, you know, kind of leveraging Stripe's infrastructure. So it seems like crypto has grown quite a bit for Stripe. And you even mm -hmm. said at the beginning that, you know, this is this is not your first kind of you know, foray into crypto that this has been top of mind uh, essentially across the last, you know, almost decade mm -hmm. at, uh, at Stripe. So just curious, can you give us any insight in like how crypto has grown in the past year? I know that you've kind of formalized this as of the last like, you know, year or so, but um, like where are you seeing the most demand from and, and why and any kind of like insight into, you know, metrics just to help us kind of quantify like how big is crypto at Stripe and what are you seeing from your clients? Um, so the... Um... Maybe taking a step back, the, so you alluded to this, we are placing a number of bets here between fiat payments, uh, USDC payouts, on-ramp. Um, and so I would take this as, as that at the moment. It's We're placing a bunch of bets and trying to move incredibly fast. And so this team is essentially in the uh, so rapid iteration, um, trying a bunch of stuff, learning as fast as we can. And so none of them are incredibly big, like none of them are Stripe size yet. Um, but they're all optimized for learning and moving fast. Um, so the the USDC payouts, as an example, um, the volumes are modest. Like, I, uh, it's to be to be uh, transparent here. Um, like it's it's a few platforms, it's a few users. It's, it's not anywhere near what we would do in fiat payments. Sure. Um, but I think we are starting to see traction, and that's what matters to us. Yes, there is a bunch of platforms that really want this. There is a bunch of users that are asking us, um, and we can only onboard them so fast. Uh, but um, we're starting to see traction. We, so we launched this product at the beginning of the year. And just for context for uh, people who might not have seen it, um, the idea there was, uh, say you're a freelancer and you're in Vietnam and you want to work for uh, a flying company, you want to work for, uh, for a company in the US, um, maybe you want to receive USDC as opposed to the local Vietnamese currency. Um, and so now we allow this platform, we make it very easy for the platform Let's say Braintrust is, a, is an example. Uh, 
we make it very easy for foreign trusts to now pay you in USDC as opposed to paying you in uh, Vietnamese local currency or, or anything else. Uh, and, and we think that enables whole new business models, especially for emerging markets. Uh, mm -hmm. It enables so, creator economy, freelancer economy in a wide variety of, of markets where maybe that wasn't the case yet. Um, so we started doing this. We're starting to learn. Um, we see a lot of interest in cryptocurrency from like Vietnam, Argentina, there's a few places. Um, part of the, the, the game here is to optimize sort of the, the last mile. Like which chain, which token precisely, how do you actually off ramp when you want to buy your groceries? Uh, or do you want to keep the, the crypto in crypto and use it as a savings uh, or an investment mechanism? How do you pay taxes? Like all of these questions, um, I think require quite a bit of more work, but this is step one. I was trying to see traction on, on step one. Yeah, early days, putting some chips on the table, getting, you know, some exposure in different aspects of the value chain, but mm -hmm. certainly a lot more to build. And just kind of curious, as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, potential adoption or interest in emerging markets. Like for those types of use cases, like you mentioned with Braintree, mm -hmm. um, where does the compliance risk? Because I, I, I'm just kind of like thinking back to the previous discussion about the new uh, on-ramp in terms of like the off-ramp. Uh, is Stripe involved in any of the like fraud verification in that part of the value chain, or is it more on the inbound as well instead? So the, um, uh, just to go, uh, brain trust, not brain tree. Uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we're involved to an extent. So <clears throat> for the payouts product, uh, just to take this as a very concrete example, um, when you onboard to be a creator or a freelancer that gets paid, um, we do two things. We check your identity and we check your wallet. Um, like if you're a sanction, if you're using a sanctioned wallet, then uh, you're out of luck. Um, and we also have to check your identity uh, for a number of reasons, uh, legal and regulatory reasons, but also for fraud and risk mitigation. Um, so that's a case where we actually have to check. Like vast amount of money are involved. Uh, we need to check fairly deeply. I think it would be a different. Um, case if we were to do uh, payment processing, like simple payment processing on, in crypto. Um, and then I think that answers part of your question. The off-ramping per se, at the moment, we don't have a, a Stripe solution for this. If you mm -hmm. receive USDC in Argentina, presumably you will use, I don't know, a Bitso or Binance or like a local exchange to, to do the, the off-ramping. At that point, they are subject to local regulations. We haven't cracked the, the code of how to make it work in 200 countries yet. <laughs> imagine it's not, I, I imagine it's something that you're looking at, um, but. Um, I think every country has their own ways of, of ramping and it's it's not always an exchange. There's a variety of me, um, mechanisms. But I think what we're also hearing from freelancers and, and, and such is that the primary value for them is savings. It's not necessarily off ramping. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to use that money to pay for groceries. Um, and so it's a, maybe a different game. Okay. Different use case. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like, as you look at this and I know it's early days and the volumes are probably drastically different on your fiat side versus your crypto side, mm -hmm. um, but any insight into the economics, are they better or worse for Stripe in terms of, you know, just the different access points or, or the, the fundamentals, like I would imagine that just how efficient blockchains are could potentially be more lucrative for Stripe, um, but any insight there? So in terms of using blockchains as payment rails, I think we're passing the savings as much as we can. We are trying to be uh, as close to the metal as possible, but we do perform a service, like we do KYC, we do uh, a number of things. So we're charging for that, um, but we're trying to pass the savings in terms of the, the blockchain parts of it. Um, yeah, the uh, the parts that are more difficult in terms of um, like where there is a gap between the blockchain and the actual service is an example for, for the on-ramp we talked about having to handle fraud. At the moment, that gap is significant. Like mm -hmm. Every on-ramp is charging a significant amount of money for the fraud mitigation and the risk mitigation. Uh, so I think as the ecosystem becomes more and more sort of, uh, more widely adopted and uh, these solutions become uh, sort of more sophisticated, I would expect these prices to go down as well. Um, ideally, blockchain makes everything so cheap and, and efficient. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, it'll take some time to get to that yeah. end state.
But as you as you were going and and you know kind of creating all these different services, um, how much blockchain specific expertise did your team need to build in? I know you know you come from an engineering background, but just curious. Um, you know, it seems like you did partner with a decent amount of infrastructure providers as as part of this stack. Yes, but just yes. curious, like how much um, you know new knowledge your team had to build in order to kind of bring these solutions to market. Uh, it's a good question. We. I was actually wondering when, when we started the team, how many Web3 developers do we need? Like hardcore Web3 smart contract developers do we need? It turns out not that many. Um, and the reason for that is partially because we are sort of playing in the space of product at the moment, mm -hmm. where the hard part is reconciliation, accounting, customer support, identity verification, fraud detection, like all of these things that Stripe has built. And therefore, um, we can focus a lot of our time on the, on the fiat side and, the, and that side of the house. Uh, the blockchain bits, we've been working with Alchemy, with Zerohash, with Polygon, Solana. We are leaning on several companies that have become very, very good at what they do. I think it would be counterproductive for us to, to try to reproduce what they did. Uh, we want to add sort of value on top. Like the gap we see is the next layer. Mm -hmm. um, the blockchain uh, itself, I think, we have excellent partners, very happy to work with them. Um, we, don't, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Now, the, the joke we have actually is, is that the, the hardest part to integrate USDC into the Stripe system was because now that was a, a four letter code instead of three letter code, like every other currency. Uh, but even that wasn't that hard to, to plug into to Stripe. Um, <laughs> so I guess to answer your question more directly, we, we don't have deep smart contract slash not infrastructure uh, type expertise in house. We don't really need to because we lean on partners that have that. Um, but we do need to understand the Web3 developer. And so we have quite a few engineers that are very deeply embedded in the community um, just so that we understand the, what the needs are and how to best uh, help uh, folks in the community. How, how much of this on the, like, on the issuer side uh, in your conversations mm -hmm. is, um, I guess, for the, those conversations with like, you know, issuing banks that you might work with that are mm -hmm. part of the flow or even the card networks, um, how much knowledge of or support from that side of your platform is there for building these types of tools? Because I would imagine that a lot of your conversations are, you know, like you said, talking to the developers and, you know, building out the tools to allow them to onboard these. But certainly there's the other side of your, your marketplace, which or the other side of your platform, which mm -hmm. is connected to the traditional banking system. So just curious, like how your engagement is on, on that side of the coin. Uh, we found quite a few really sort of crypto forward uh, partners. Not everybody is excited about crypto. Uh, I think uh, some banks fall very much on the side of really excited about crypto and some very much on the side of we don't want to touch it with a 15 foot pole. Uh, and so I think all the card networks, we've we've had lots of discussions. They all have sort of a, um, a crypto department, if you will, and they've uh, pushed the envelope uh, on their side. Um, on the issuers, I think the, maybe it's a little more mixed. Um, we, uh, some are more crypto forward, some are less. I think part of the game here is if one company can represent the case of the crypto community, like all the good things about it uh, to crypto issuers, the two, sorry, card issuers, uh, that might actually be Stripe or, or one of the, the companies that have that scale. Like, here, look at this market. You're, you're missing out on a, on a very important uh, part, of the, part of the economy here. Um, so I'm hoping we, we can help drive authorization rates, as an example. Um, and I think both networks and, and uh, issuers are very open to having that discussion with us. Yeah. So when you uh, you alluded to, you know, the, the sentiment about some banks wouldn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole or 15 foot pole. Is there any specific reasons that you've heard in, you know, across the board? Is it compliance concerns? Is it disintermediation risk? Is it, you know, just general lack of understanding? And so higher priorities, like just mm -hmm. curious, like if you break that down. It's a little bit of all of the above. Um, I think the the space is difficult to work in, especially as a bank. You, you have very unclear regulations. You have very many potential um, outcomes of future regulations. And and um, at the same time, you, you sort of bear the brunt of all the bad things that can happen. Like the credit risk is on you. The uh, yeah. A lot of the fraud mitigation chargebacks are on you. Um, so I understand banks wanting to be a little um, conservative in their approach to crypto. And um, 
but not all of them are, and, and some of them want to experiment a little more freely than others. Um, sure. It's, all of these is compliance regulations are, are challenging, the fraud risk is challenging for, for banks. And certainly we're heading into a macro environment where there's a lot of concerns for banks in general. So uh, completely, yeah. completely understand the stack of priorities there. Yeah. This um, is a big opportunity. I think if it's done well sure. and uh, within the right frameworks, with, with the right controls, I think it can be a huge opportunity for well, growing the GDP. Yeah, and it's a very blanket statement, but you know, Web3 mm -hmm. is creating opportunities for you know consumers to interact with their favorite brands or their favorite, um, you know, or through financial instruments that are potentially not accessible in the legacy landscape. And so, not being where your customers are is mm -hmm. definitely a uh, concern, especially you know, it's classic brick and mortar to e-commerce. If you weren't online uh, through the pandemic, you were missing out on a lot of sales, and that potentially could be the same case here for cryptos. Absolutely. And, Consumers continue to like, you know, put more assets on chain and, and transact in these uh, in these new ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So I guess on that thread, um, you know, just a general high level, how do you see crypto changing the payment space? Mm -hmm. um, like you're seeing a lot of different trends from from your seat. Just curious, like what do you have planned next, and and what kind of changes are you seeing on the on the horizon? Um, I want to maybe take a so zooming out a little bit and, and take a, a, a bigger perspective of this question. The <clears throat> the, the thing we are trying to to solve here is we want programmable, cheap, easy, frictionless, global money movement, like all of that. We want all of these properties. Um, and crypto solves some of that and fiat payments have solved some of that over time. Um, but today it's incredibly difficult to move money around the world. Like if you're an example, if you're traveling with Airbnb and you're from Brazil, but you're in Vietnam and you're, you want to pay in USD, it gets insanely complicated. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be Airbnb. It's an it's a incredibly complicated situation to deal with. Um, maybe crypto can make that easier. Uh, crypto remittances are much easier. At the same time, creating wallets and managing sort of the, the regulation risk is also harder at the moment. Um, so I don't think there is a perfect solution, but I can see sort of we are getting closer and closer to this programmable, cheap, easy, frictionless global money movement. And that is what we want to do at Stripe. Like we want to compose all the building blocks that exist, whether fiat or crypto, to get to that end state. Um, and I don't think we are quite there yet. Um, but I'm personally very excited about how much crypto can contribute towards this. I don't think crypto can solve it alone. But um, so the, the crypto community has proven that um, there is a lot of brain power there. The merge was a huge technical accomplishment earlier this year. Uh, we can solve a lot of problems, and some of them are very hard problems, but I'm, I'm confident we can solve them. Um, and over time, it becomes much more seamless and easy to use and well integrated with the fiat systems. Um, like everything is sort of one click, uh, and ideally, my, my grandmother can use it. <laughs> it's not scary anymore. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. I think we're not uh... quite there yet, but I'm, I'm optimistic. No, absolutely. And and it seems like the, the cycles for innovation continue to get shorter and shorter. Um, and, you know, having uh, broad participation from both sides of the traditional system and the and the new system um, being brought together by folks like yourself is really inspiring to see, especially with um, just the, you know, the, the fundamental principles that you just outlined there. I think everybody agrees that it would just unlock a tremendous amount of value, um, but it has to be done in the right way and with a broad, broad participation. So yeah, lots lots to be built, lots to be done. It's exciting to see Stripe continue to put some more chips on the table. Um, well, I know uh, we, we went through, we covered a lot of ground there. I really appreciate the conversation, but any closing thoughts except for your final uh, score for the match between <laughs> France and Morocco on Wednesday? I don't want to put predictions on this one. I'm, uh, I'll be looking uh, very closely at, uh, at the match. <laughs> very excited about it. Um, I'm generally excited to do our part. I don't think we can solve all the problems. We can hopefully contribute uh, meaningfully to to, uh, to some of them. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, keep the so, the user feedback, the input, uh, what all Stripe should do uh, in this space. I'm always excited to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, and Compound continues to innovate. We we launched a new uh, toolkit called Extensions last week. So I'm sure developers can continue to find new ways to hook into the systems that we built through this new platform. And, uh, you know, look to look forward to continue to innovate with yourself and others as we all look to, you know, 
further execute on the potential in this space. But I appreciate you hopping on the phone and coming with us. Uh, we'll have to check back in in a few weeks, uh, a few months as you continue to roll out new services. But uh, thanks again, Guillaume. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll do uh, another episode of Compound Thesis in the new year. This is the last one for 2022. Thanks for everybody coming on the ride with us uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, we'll see you in the beginning of 2023. Thanks again.